If you get your views from television news, you'll only hear stories that corporations choose. You'll only get to see what they want you to see. You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe. in horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder how they fell so fast well maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask Don't you think it's strange? There were no fighter jets. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is episode 10 this year, the 10th show of 2012. Well, we've got a lot to cover today. I'm going to start right out. The, the first thing is a little bit of good news. Everybody always asks me, you know, how hopeless it, real, the situation seems. That, you know, what are we going to do? Is it really that hopeless? I don't think it's that hopeless. There's always a, a glimmer that you can hold on to, and one of them just happened uh, a little over a week ago, right around there. We had a great court decision that uh, was, you know, it was the National Defense Authorization Act had Section 1021, which was the indefinite detention part of it that allowed the military to lock up U.S. citizens on U.S. soil without a warrant, without charges, and put them in jail indefinitely without access to a lawyer in peacetime. Okay, well, Chris Hedges, a journalist, and a group of other journalists sued the Obama administration, and guess what? They just won. Okay, we're going to go ahead and play this. Uh, go ahead and put the laptop behind me. And this will explain it. This is an interview on Russia Today with the, uh, the winning uh, council. So here we go. We'll be back in about nine minutes. Has ruled that provisions in the controversial law may violate our constitutional rights. President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act back in December. The move has outraged activists that say the law is so vague it allows U.S. citizens to be indefinitely detained by the military without due process. But a group of activists sued President Obama, and yesterday the federal judge took their side. Here is part of the court order issued by Judge Catherine Forrest. It reads, quote, this court is acutely aware that preliminary preliminarily in joining an act of Congress must be done with great caution. However, it is the responsibility of our judicial system to protect the public from acts of Congress which infringe upon constitutional rights. So the law has been blocked, at least for now. To talk more about the case and the implications of it, I'm joined by Carl Mayer. He's co-lead counsel with Bruce Afrin, representing the plaintiffs in this case. Welcome to the show, Carl. So a huge victory for you. Your reaction to the judge's ruling? Thank you for having me on, Ms. Wall. Uh, my reaction is that, uh, in large part due to a district judge, federal district judge Forrest, America is more free today than it was yesterday. This was a hugely important uh, landmark ruling. It's uh, very rare that a, a judge will declare unconstitutional an act of Congress. And that's what Judge Forrest did yesterday in a very sound, very reasoned, very persuasive, intricate constitutional opinion that held directly that when you have a law as vague as the NDAA or the so-called Homeland Battlefield Act that seeks to put Americans in jeopardy of being placed in a military brig or prison or in a military tribunal, that this is a fundamental violation of our free speech rights. It's also a fundamental violation of uh, due process rights in this country because people should be entitled to know the standards by which they would be judged. So this is truly uh, a very important, very critical ruling by Judge Forrest yet yesterday. And right now we're calling on President Obama to issue a statement publicly that he will not appeal this ruling. 
that what he will do is agree to enter into a permanent injunction so that never again will United States citizens ever have any concern that they will be placed in a military prison or placed in a military uh, trial system where they have no right to uh, uh, right to a trial by jury of their peers, such that the, our freedoms will be forever guaranteed. And this is what President Obama ought to do. The judge has issued a, a preliminary injunction, which is indefinite. It means the NDAA cannot be used to uh, pick up Americans in a, in a proverbial black van or uh, in, any other, in any other way that the administration might uh, decide to try to get people into the military justice system. It means that the government is foreclosed now from engaging in this type of uh, uh, action against the civil liberties of Americans. But uh, the, the federal government could still appeal. They have the right to, but we are suggesting that it would not be in their best interest because uh, there are so many people from all sides of the political spectrum opposed to this law that they ought to just say, we're not going to appeal, we'll enter into a permanent injunction. And by the way, candidate Romney should also issue a statement on this because this is such an important issue to the American people. Uh, there are members of the Republican Party, for example, Ron Paul, even Rick Santorum, for example, opposed the, the NDAA. So this is not a left or right issue. This is simply what it means. This is an issue about what it means to be an American. And the Bill of Rights was something that our ancestors fought to achieve to prevent the British from exercising the control, sovereign control and authoritarian control over this country. And it's incredible to me that we're even having this discussion today. But we I'm sorry, you wanted to make a point? No, I was just going to ask you, Carl, um, because this is just temporary. This is a preliminary injunction. Um, and you said that the government can still appeal uh, at this point. So are you confident that, that you'll prevail? Oh, I'm, I'm very confident that we'll prevail, even if they do appeal, because Judge Forrest's opinion was a 68-page, uh, very well-reasoned and, and sound opinion that relied on recent precedent in the, in the uh, circuit that we're in, which is the, the, the second circuit for uh, the New York area uh, and Supreme Court precedent. So I'm very confident that we would win any appeal. Uh, uh, furthermore, a preliminary injunction is an extraordinary measure for court to take. And what it says, in order to issue a preliminary injunction, the judge has to make a finding on the record. And there was a very extensive record on this case. In this case, the judge has to make a finding that in fact, we will prevail on the merits should the case proceed. So the, the burden of proof is now entirely shifted to the government, and they have an uphill battle. And frankly, I don't, I don't see how they can surmount it. So uh, I think that, that this will stand and that our civil liberties will be protected. All right, now that we know what the legal standing of this is, we uh, want to take a moment to talk about some of the arguments that, that have gone on here. Um, and what has made the NDA so controversial is how vague it is. And the fact that it's vagueness, critics say it opens up all kinds of scary possibilities. The plaintiffs, um, you know, you fear that report, even reporting on terrorists could be considered grounds for being detained under this law. And, and the judge acknowledged right. the danger right. of some of the language in, in this bill. Can you talk about that? That's right. Sure. Absolutely. The, the, the language of the bill, for example, stated that uh, anyone could be captured under the law if they were considered to give, quote, substantial support to Al Qaeda or other terrorist organizations, uh, or th th they were even giving support to organizations that were enemies of America coalition forces, not just the United States. So it is so vague, these terms like substantial support, that even journalists or activists or citizens or protesters could be caught up in the act. And in fact, the people that were in, involved as plaintiffs here were in fact former, a former reporter for the New York Times, Chris Hedges, the legendary whistleblower, Daniel Ellsberg, and some very young activists who were involved with Occupy Wall Street. And incredibly, there were, there were various security memorandums identifying Occupy Wall Street, Occupy London, and other affiliated groups as in fact terrorist organizations, which show, according to the US government. And for them to label these groups that are largely peaceful protesters as terrorist organizations shows the assault that we're facing on our civil liberties and how important it is to stand up uh, against this. And so, go ahead. 
Uh, no, um, just wanted to mention another argument that the government made is that the NDAA essentially just reaffirms a law that already exists. That law being the authorization for use of military force. This is a 2001 law. But neither you nor the judge buys this argument. Why not? Right. right. That's that's an excellent question. Uh, you've really done your homework. That's a, a fantastic question. That the, the judge would have none of that argument because the authorization for military force was passed right after 9-11. And it was specifically targeted to either members of al-Qaeda or people who participated in the 9-11 attack. This law, the NDAA, goes so far beyond that as to make it co a completely different and, and indistinguishable effort. It goes so far beyond that anyone who gives, quote, substantial support, and that could include a writer, a journalist, et cetera, could be caught up on it. So really the AUMF was a, to a narrow law directed at people who commit violent acts and involved the 9-11 attack. And in fact, in the courtroom, Judge Forrest cross-examined the lawyers for the government and asked plainly, can you assure these journalists here that you will not be subject to the NDAA? And they would not, multiple times, they refused to answer. They refused to give those assurances. They only said, we cannot give those assurances. We cannot give those assurances. And therefore, the judge found, and the record supports, that any journalist could have a reasonable fear that they would be prosecuted under this law. And that's why I think it's so important, not just to you and your colleagues, who are journalists, but anyone who considers themselves an activist and interested in the truth. And I'll tell you another important point is that this really shows the, 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 criti the critical nature of having a separations of, of power of government, to have, be able to have a judiciary review what the executive branch and the congressional branch do in order to make sure that they follow the Constitution. Because essentially, here the executive branch and the Congress have colluded to create a, an, enti an entirely unconstitutional, anti-First Amendment, anti-due due process system that is uh, fundamentally anathema to American principles. All right, and I'm Carl. Just so uh, delighted we could uh, we could achieve this victory. Do, uh, don't mean to cut you off there, but um, definitely achieve something that a lot of people feared couldn't be achieved. They're very interesting. Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was Carl so Mayer. Much. He's the co-lead counsel with Bruce Afrin representing the plaintiffs in this case. Okay. Um, Man, he, he's exactly right. That's my feeling is if we can't work it out with the system we have, we're screwed. I mean, that's the bottom line. And this shows that the system can still work. So, you know, in no way, I mean, if we have to go taking up arms and doing all that, we've, we've actually lost. I mean, maybe future generations would benefit from that, but we're going to die. So we got to make it work. Now, there's, you know, we can't even keep up with it. They're hitting us so fast with new stuff that we can't hardly react to it. And what I mean by that is we just had a victory against the NDAA. Well, that's all right. They're switching to drones. You know, they aren't going to need an, an army or a navy. They don't have to worry about having, you know, soldiers or anything else. And this is the next thing we're going to have to work on. So I've got a, a good one here to play for you on that subject. So we'll go right into that right now. Watching us all from overhead, the federal a new generation of surveillance drones could soon be watching us all from overhead. The Federal Aviation Administration is expected to announce plans to expand the use of domestic drones in American airspace. Eyes in the sky, similar to the unmanned aircraft that the United States has been using to target terrorists abroad. Here at home, the surveillance systems can be used to track terrorists or drug dealers or to find missing children or locate wandering Alzheimer's patients. Lots of different good uses, but the critics warn the use of drones presents a major threat to all of our personal privacy. Meantime, a newly discovered Air Force intelligence document leaked and posted online states, if drones capture surveillance footage of Americans incidentally, the data can be stored and analyzed by the Pentagon for up to 90 days. And that's not all. The Fox Report's chief correspondent, Jonathan Hunt, is with us. When, when are these drones likely to be flying, and how many of them might there be above our heads? Well, there's a growing number already, Shep, but according to the experts, and indeed the FAA itself, there could be as many as 30 
30,000 of these kind of drones, 30,000 flying overhead within the next decade. Now, obviously, law enforcement uh, agencies love these drones, and they say they'll be able to save lives in things like hostage situations or search and rescue operations. But obviously, the privacy concerns are huge because they will in effect bring every single backyard in America into the authorities view you've always had an expectation of privacy in your own backyard you will no longer have it with with these there and there is essentially no real legislation currently written to curtail where they can go to limit what they can see that's the obvious concern Jim. the language on this document Jonathan uh, incidentally getting video of Americans doing something. And what, what does this mean? Well, for instance, one of these drones is up, say, heading down to the U.S.-Mexico border to check out the situation there. Or it's up looking over a traffic incident in uh, downtown Chicago. But if they're on their way flying to either of those incidents, they look down, it's, it records in your backyard footage, say, of a whole bunch of bags of fertilizer and some tomato plants. You working on it? Are those really tomato plants? Are they marijuana plants? Are you getting that fertilizer for your garden, or are you getting it to make bombs? They then have a reason, they say, to keep that footage, analyze it for up to 90 days, and start looking into all manner of things that you may or may not have been doing. Is, is there going to be a new rule about everybody building an extra bedroom? Yes, you cannot build an extra bedroom. Well, I thought you were going to have to, to allow a member of the government to live in the house with you. <laughs> no? That may be where we're headed. The judge probably knows better than me on that. It would probably be better than I. It would probably be good, be good for housing. Housing starts. We be good yes. for construction workers. And Jerry Willis can address that one as well. We have everybody at the table here to sort out the entire situation. A member of government for everyone and a bedroom for all. Wow, wow. It's good and great welcome, now, John. Welcome to Monday. Drones for all. Thanks. Well, well. Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is with They can't require us to build an extra bedroom, but I guess they can spy on us from ahead. Well, they can't spy on us from ahead. They really can't, can no, they? No, they can't. But they will. D did you see any legislation enacted by the Congress or signed by the President or any amendment to the Constitution? No. Answer, no. These are regulations in which bureaucrats gave themselves the authority to capture images of us in the privacy of our backyards and depending upon how low the drones fly, Jonathan can back me up, inside the home, if yep. the drone is able to see inside the home, and to retain and analyze and distribute amongst members of the government what they find. This is not permitted by the Constitution. It's not permitted by federal law. The Congress didn't vote on it. The President's been silent about it. Bureaucrats did it on their own. And this has been the case forever. And I know from working local television 15, 20, uh, longer than that ago, <laughs> If you, as a citizen, have a reasonable expectation of privacy, for instance, your girlfriend is laying out by the pool in the backyard and you have a 12-foot fence around your backyard. If my television camera shoots over that 12-foot fence at that woman who's naked in the backyard, I've committed a crime because she has a reasonable expectation of privacy. The drone shouldn't be allowed to do that either for the exact same reason. I would make the same argument as uh, your hypothetical neighbor who wants to see what your girlfriend looks like. The government would commit the crime. Shep, this is very serious. It's one thing for the government to do it. It's another thing for the Defense Department to do it. Mm. The Defense Department cannot engage in any activity in the United States of America without an executive order from the president that must be published. So if the president has authorized the Defense Department, Jonathan spoke about the Air Force, to fly drones over anybody's backyard and we don't know about it, then the president and the Air Force have violated numerous federal criminal statutes. But nobody seems to much care. Nobody seems to, to very much care. Why isn't the Congress up in arms? Same Congress that let the president bomb Libya is going to let his Air Force spy in our backyards and like potted plants, they'll look the other way. And there'll never be any sort of retribution for this. There'll never be anything. It's just suddenly there'll be tens of thousands of drones up in the air watching what we do. Now, if you're not doing anything, you might say, I'm not doing anything. I don't care. Well, should we just throw out the whole Constitution? Should we just run by a new set of rules? What, what, what should we do? The Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment were written to guarantee us the right to be left alone, meaning governments stay out of our face. We are living perfectly normal, lawful lives. We don't want you in our faces as we do it. Suddenly the government, silently from 30,000 feet above, is violating those, uh, those amendments. It is quite a thing. And it's mighty quiet. Yes. Okay. Judge Napolitano, thank you. You're welcome, Shep. Soon there will be government. All right. I came out early on that because we, I've got a really important section here. Uh, Sibel Edmonds, as I've introduced before, is the most gagged or most classified women, woman in history. 
She's the lady who patriotically, right after 9-11, went to work for the FBI as a translator, and she started listening and reviewing all of the communications uh, in the Middle East uh, before, well, back in the 1990s on up through the present. And she uncovered the government conspiracy uh, for 9-11, and she tried to blow the whistle by going to her FBI superiors who tried to, you know, shut her up. So she went to their superiors. She went through all the channels for whistleblowers, and she met, I mean, she was just like you or I would be. We'd go to these things naively thinking, we're going to show them this corruption and they're going to take care of it because that's what they're here for. But it turns out that the people in the department that handles whistleblowers, they're there to shut up the whistleblowers and protect the, uh, you know, more than a billion documents a year or, or even more classification into uh, top secret or whatever it is. We don't need that secrecy. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and play the Sibel Edmonds cut. Let's see if I can get it up here. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's up. Welcome back to this special edition of InfoWars Nightly News. At the end of this next interview, we've got something really special coming up, so be sure and stay with us. But right now, we've got something incredibly important. They call Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers, uh, you know, the most famous and most important whistleblower in modern U.S. history. Well, he just leaked some CIA Rain Corporation documents that the war was being lost in Vietnam and was really just about war profiteering. And so they wanted it to keep going forever. And the objectives that they had claimed to bring freedom had nothing to do with it. It was about opium and a lot more. Quite frankly, what Daniel Ellsberg talked about pales in significance to Seabell Edmonds, a FBI translator uh, going over top you know, security clearance, NSA intercepts. Um, she went to work for him three days after 9-11, and she looked at intercepts from the mid-90s right up until 9-11. And what she saw blew her away. She went to Congress and was gagged. The information that um, she was able to see confirms everything that we've reverse engineered on the outside, that 9-11 was a synthetic false flag staged event. Al-Qaeda is a creation of Western intelligence to menace the West so they can take our liberties, but also bring down other regimes in the area that try to be more sensible and build up their society. The jihadis uh, basically are a group just turned loose by the globalists, the banking interests that dominate our country in Europe, to destroy Arab and Muslim nations that try to build up. And that's the whole history. You know, they admit Mujahideen was founded by the CIA, but it's a lot deeper than that. Look at how Al-Qaeda has been used. You know, one thing Bush said was the terrorists attacked us because they hate our freedom. And the people with Bush and now Obama have destroyed our liberties and our freedoms to a cartoon level. I mean, it's, it's so off the charts. It's like a comic book or something. NDAA, secret arrests, light posts that listen to you, drones in the skies, TSA, you know, m m molesting people. I guess the terrorists really did attack us because they hated our freedom. The military industrial complex controlled by foreign banks, they attacked us through their proxies that took the blame because they did hate our freedom. It's actually true. The terrorists did attack us. It's the criminal elements of the government and the mega corporations who are the terrorists, and they do hate our freedoms because our freedoms and our Bill of Rights and due process would put all of them in jail for the insider trading, the trillions in banker bailouts, and the looting and criminality we see right now. And all over the world, an iron curtain of tyranny is descending over nations under the guise of 9-11 and terrorism. But in the front of the paper, not even in the back, they admit Al-Qaeda are heroes in Libya, funded by NATO, the CIA, Mossad, and others. And now in Syria, the U.S. Ambassador Rice uh, to the U.N., she said two weeks ago, she said, Assad, there'll be more bombings of your government buildings if you don't step down. And who's bombing them? Al-Qaeda. Trained in Turkey and other areas and brought in by the United States, the so-called U.S., the criminals that have hijacked us. And all this is done in our name. The lady we're about to talk to is an inside whistleblower who witnessed this, and they've threatened her with jail time for violating national security. That national security now means their criminal actions. If she exposes who al-Qaeda was really working for on 9-11, and she has a new book out 
that we're going to be telling you about as well. Uh, but even the ACLU calls her uh, the, the most classified woman uh, and one of the biggest whistleblowers in history. And again, we have to pray for her and support her and get her book because she is right now facing the potential of them threatening to come arrest her for publishing this book. Seabell, good to have you on with us. Thank you for having me on again, Alex. Well, we had you on the radio yesterday, but now I just want to sit back, and I've got some questions later, but in the next 15 minutes or so, you've got the floor. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Start with a question, and I'll get well, going. Well, just tell people how it all began. I, I, mean, I mean, because last time I directed the questions, in this interview, I want you to be able you know, if you were addressing millions of people, which you are, I'm asking you, what would you say to them? What's most important in your huge story that's been confirmed? Well, the most important thing is what is our government doing? What has it been doing? And why they have been covering up what they have been doing for so long? Because, you know, if you're not engaged in something really wrong, outrageous, you won't have this need to cover up. You won't have to classify 5 million documents every single day. That's what they do. There are billions of documents. These are government documents. This is the, supposed to be the government of the people, for the people, by the people. So if you have billions of documents kept secret, if you have the government who issues gag orders on government insiders who come forward and dare to report on government's own wrongdoing, criminal operations, criminal activities, waste, fraud, abuse. How can this government be a government of the people, for the people, by the people? You have all these classification, all these cover-ups, you have gag orders. We have had, since Obama became president, we have had seven government whistleblowers prosecuted. Look, even Dan Ellsberg didn't go to jail. And guess what? Outside Dan Ellsberg, we haven't had a whistleblower that has been indicted, ever. And just in this short period, we have had this president, the so-called liberal president, that has convicted seven, seven government whistleblowers. Their crime? coming out, letting the pub public know that their government is engaged in criminal activities all over the world and here in the United States, whether it's torture, whether billions of dollars, billions of dollars, that all these people who can't afford in our country to pay for their medical bills, okay? Look at the state of our schools, our libraries, and our government, with all this deficit that we have, Alex, I, you know it. I mean, I don't want to be preaching to the choir here. It's wasting every month billions of dollars. You know why? Because it is not accountable. One of the, one of the examples I give people is if you witness a crime, you know, murder, burglary, what do you do? Usually you go and take, up, you know, take out your cell phone and you call the police. What if you witness your government, the police is committing some heinous crime? Who do you have to call? If you look at the federal courts since 9-11, find one case where the federal court has not sided with the government and helped the government cover up, whether by accepting secrecy and state secrets privilege or just plain going and indict a, a, a whistleblower. And they have a name for that. It's called <laughs> it's called tyranny. Uh, please continue. It is. it is. And you know, when we come, whether we the government insiders who have come out and they say we blew the whistle, we basically told the people what we saw being done to our national security, to our welfare, national welfare by our own government, that if, if you, co you come out and say it, you say it in your show every day. I say it, right? They call us the radicals, the nutcases. The, these are the, uh, oh, these are the marginal people. Uh, there are 9-11 cooks. Oh, the other one is a conspiracy theorist. They have now put millions of Americans in this bucket with the help of the mainstream media. And I always add, Alex, with the help of the 
alternative, quasi-alternative media, a lot of people think, oh yeah, well, I'm not reading Washington Post or New York Times. I am reading so-and-so. Go look who is funding so-and-so. It's actually on their website. If it says Rockefeller and Soros and Carnegie, are you reading alternative views and news? Are you under that illusion? So when I say with the media, they are, because more and more people are waking up and the number is increasing, the number that our government and our media designate as nutcases, conspiracy theorists. That's what we are, millions of us. You know, it's like the story of this king and this poisoned well. And those who refused to drink the poisoned water and then go crazy were being pointed out to and say, you know, people, majority, 95, look at these crazy people. Well, we haven't been drinking the government poisoned water. And because of that, we are being persecuted. We are being marginalized. And, and this is what this book is about. A lot of, unfortunately, whistleblowers, they... And this is also by design by many of these nonprofit organizations, industrial complex, because they have become an industry. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars are being poured by those big 1% into these so-called NGOs. And these NGOs have uh, not secret, open partnership with the government. They want whistleblowers to whine and to come out and say, I am a victim. Look at me. Look what they've done to me. They ruined my life. Did they ruin my life? Yes. Did they fire me? Yes. But what I did with this book was to show people what government tried to do to the American people, what it has been doing to the American people, taking away their right to know. Because as long as people are uninformed, they can go on. They have actually, they have been expanding. So I put in this one book, the book that government has been fighting for 383 days now. They have been saying, you're not allowed to publish a single word in this book. My attorneys and I kept sending letters to them saying, cite a law. Oh, well, we're going to cite the classification. We have to redact and we have to redact everything. He said, well, you had 30 days to do that. We are moving forward. We are armed, you know, by our First Amendment is on our side, and we're going to do it. Because we have to push it. Every time we have an opportunity, we have to push it. If we sit, if we just sit and take it, every day is going to get worse. Today, they started by having us remove our shoes, Alex. But, you know, one of the things that for me it's ironic is, if you step back and look at people removing their shoes, what do you see? They actually bend over, right? This is like bending over before the kings. There they are, the government batch people. We are untying our shoes, bending over, taking, removing our shoes. Psychologically, they are training us to see them as the superior gods, you know, like the Greek gods. Well, the what about the famous photos in, in film of, of people in Nazi Germany stripping down and, and going into the facilities? It is psychological warfare. You take the shoes off, then it's the belt off the coat. Now we're going to put you in a scanner. Now we're going to touch you on top of the scanner. Now we're going to go in your pants. Now we're going to make Miss USA cry. Now we're going to take your child, your two-year-old, as they scream away, and we're going to strip search them behind closed doors. Now we're going to take old ladies behind closed doors. We're going to exercise power over you. It's totally clear the terrorists attacked us because they hate our freedom. The terrorists are the people that hijacked our government. But for people that don't know who you are or have just seen the headlines in the news, recap the, you know, the fact that there you were as a language specialist for the FBI at the highest levels of national security, looking at all these NSA intercepts. You, know, you had these degrees. Uh, you know, you, uh, you believed in the system. You said yesterday on the radio. You go to work and then walk people through the process of telling Congress what happened. And for those that don't know, when you've worked in the national security system, which is actually the national tyranny system and to secure the criminal takeover, but you don't know it. When you work in there, now you've signed all these agreements. So you're one of the few whistleblowers to go public at this level. And they are threatening you right now. That's very important. Because they want to set some sort of a precedence. They did it with my case, Alex, with state secrets privilege. As you said, I took the job 
And you know how 20 years, 15 years later, they were so open, our government saying, oh yeah, we worked with the Taliban and Al Qaeda, including bin Laden in 1980s, because that was when we had this big grand cold war. We were trying to defeat the Soviet. So we forged these partnerships. They ended there. I went to work for the FBI and I dealt with these operations, investigations of operations that dealt uh, with the time frame 1996 till 2001, these operations, these files, under FBI's counterintelligence and counterespionage investigations under those two units. And not only me, but with the agents who also knew this, they were also aggravated by this, they were also outraged by this. You could see that, well, the Cold War never ended. Those partnerships never ended. In 1996, you know, until 2001, until right after September 11, we were still partners with the same organizations, you know, these factions from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt. And what we were doing, we were creating, and I believe we are still doing that. I have been out of the FBI, but I don't believe that they stopped these operations and creating terror cells, put them in Central Asia and Caucasus. These uh, resource-rich, oil-rich, natural gas-rich region that used to be part of the Soviet Union. <coughs> Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. So it never ended. That partnership never ended. And they were working with Zawahiri, Ayman Zawahiri. They were working with Bin Laden. They were working with several other groups that were from uh, Middle East, including governmental groups, including, you know, certain faction of Pakistani government to very openly create terror cells in Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. And this went on till 9-11 and then continued until February 2002. February 2002 is was when, for the first time, I went outside the FBI, went to the inspector general's office, I went to Congress. And these operations, if they continued before 9-11 and after 9-11, that story does not match the story of bin Laden is most wanted. We have this war against Al-Qaeda. By the way, they never refer to them as Al-Qaeda. It was never Al-Qaeda. Within these operation files that we had in the FBI, it was never. We actually said bin Laden groups, and bin Laden was plural. It was not only Osama bin Laden. There were four other bin Laden families, some of them from U.S., $150 million together with certain prince, together with two people from State Department, 1998, going to Azerbaijan for the opening of five mosques, mosques and madrasas combined. These are the religious schools. They, they were together in this partnership. They, were, they established over 300, 300 madrasas and mosques combined because some of these madrasas are part of these mosques. They built 300 mosques in Central Asia and Caucasus in six years. You want to see the documents? They are not hiding. They can classify mosques. Go find out who paid for those mosques, Alex. Not the people in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. No, U.S. taxpayers. This even came out in the Washington Post shortly after 9-11. And heroin money. And heroin money. Because they, they keep giving this story to people about... On one hand, they come and they say, currently, the uh, opium production, the value, street value is somewhere between 100 and $150 billion, okay? This is Time Magazine, these disgusting people, Time Magazine. Then they have this picture of these really uh, bearded guys in Afghanistan, you know, with their white shalwar. They are the farmers. So they want to give this illusion that $150 billion industry is operated by these guys. By these guys, most of them can't write, read. They don't have bank accounts, Alex. And that's the picture they show you. This $150 billion industry involves banks, involves military planes, involves private planes to transport, involves labs. Those labs, they need chemicals. Okay, they need equipments. How can a guy in a shalwar produce 
let's put hundred, let's put five thousand of them. And if that's the case, the street value is hundred fifty billion dollars, Alex. Well, the GDP of Afghanistan currently is four billion dollars. Three billion dollars of it comes from us directly. A, obviously, it is not in Afghan economy. Well, see, Bell, let me just stop you right there because Don't be because asked that question though in the media. Sure, no, that's that's uh, that's important. Let me just stop you right there because you're somebody who was seeing all these communiques, and and that confirms what we know now. But why are they trying to block your book when it was first being published? when now everything you're saying for 10 years is mainstream news. I mean, it's hidden in the news, but it's like, yes, NATO is funding Al-Qaeda to take over Libya and Syria, and yes, opium production is now 93% of world production in Afghanistan from less than 10%, and they have the troops on TV saying, we're forced to grow the opium. They don't even hide it. And you're using the old argument, you know, people used decades ago of hundreds of billions of drug money. It's being laundered by the big banks. Now it's come out that Wachovia and Wells Fargo and all these guys are laundering the money. It's not even hidden. So people always say, well, there'd be whistleblowers if something like this was happening. There they, they are. Have, you they, have had several whistleblowers. Exactly. We've had whistleblowers. This is going on. It's clear what's happening, but specifically... Getting into the communiques, uh, you know, right up, uh, because you were on my show a few years ago and you said, when you started, first started, you know, breaking your gag order, you said the West was commanding Al-Qaeda, including senior people, right up until 9-11. So, so, I mean, I want you to go into that, and you talked about money, guns, drugs, things like that, the types of things you saw going on. You said that, and, and, and before I get into that, Alex, you say, well, everybody knows, so what's the big deal? 98% of people don't. Alex, you may be fortunate to be surrounded by people who are informed. They are the ones who go to real alternatives. Okay, so let's say you have one or two or three million listeners, who people who go and read, that's it. And take a look at that percentage. I mean, those people who are tuning into Larry King, the ones at the airport, they're rushing through and buying uh, Newsweek and Time magazines, my neighbors, my neighbor's friends, my, my, my daughter's friend's mother, they don't know. In fact, you won't believe this. Nobody knows in my neighborhood that who's Savelle Edmonds. They've never heard of it. Yeah, I wasn't CBS 60 Minutes. Somebody may recall there was some FBI whistleblower, but you, you're talking about these issues. And thanks to the quasi-alternative media and the mainstream media, you're looking at a very small percentage who read, let's say, Peter Dale Scott, and they listen to your shows, and they are, you know, they're exposed to what we're exposing. Thankfully, the number is going up. You know, this is why I started my site as well. The, and But with this book, with this book, the government knows this is not a mainstream book. This book, nobody can see it in bookstores. You know why? Because the top tier publishers, they said, oh, we believe it will sound very good, but we're not going to touch this. At this point, this case is still in some ways hot. We don't want to be in the wrong side of the FBI. Another publisher said, you know, American people, they, they like to read on, in political books like this, one side or another. It's either Republican or if it's Democrat. You're coming and trashing all of them, saying they're all corrupt, they're all awful. Well, that doesn't well, happen. Well, yeah, you're exposing, like Ron yeah. Paul, the whole phony game, but more and more the people do know the emperor is wearing no clothes. But, I mean, let's be specific. You tried to go through the establishment route. The FBI is supposed to have a month to either cut stuff out or argue that. They sat on a year. Go over the threats you've gone through, that whole, that whole process. Sure. See, I started working with the FBI three days after 9-11. This is uh, September 14, September 15, 2001. I am naive. I have a master's degree in public policy. I'm a first generation immigrant. I'm a great believer of this great nation of separation of powers and, and system of checks and balances, freedom. I mean, here, I, mean, I was active, my family. I and mean, if you read this book, you, you understand where I come from. My father was tortured by Iran's Shah, okay? His toenails were pulled. He was a surgeon, he was a doctor. Do you know why, Alex? Because in his possession, he had two books. One of them was Steinbach, okay? So that's what, that landed my father in jail. 
so I come from that background. I thought I'm in a country, all I have to do, like most Americans, I go and vote every four years. Everything seems to be taken care of, like many Americans believe, just eat hot dogs, it's 4th of July, yeehaw, just celebrate. Well, that was the mentality I had when I went working for the FBI. And, and I signed these documents, classification documents, saying you are getting top secret clearance. Anytime during your life, not only when you're working for the FBI, if you ever write anything that is nonfiction related to the FBI and what you saw here, what you worked on here, has to be vetted by us. You have to submit it to us, the government, the Justice Department, FBI. We'll go through it with our marker. And my God, we are God because we are not answerable to anyone and we redact. You can't say this. You can't say this. Oh, this is highly embarrassing. You can't say this either. Then you can go fight it in court. Go spend three hundred thousand dollars. Get attorneys who are charging four hundred, you know, five hundred dollars per hour. Fight for years. I signed it, and I didn't even think about it twice. Today, this is just a side note, Alex. We have over six, seven million people in America who have, you know, top secret clearance. They don't realize what they have done. These people who are signing because they are contractor with the government. I mean. I, I know guys who are the computer technicians, but because they do something in Langley, they have to sign this, this documents, meaning they don't realize that they are signing away their First Amendment right. So those documents are illegal, not illegal maybe, but unconstitutional in the first place. Who says that you have to give up? It's one thing to say you cannot disclose methods of intelligence gathering, be specific, but they are not specific in these documents. Anyhow, I went in there, green, idealistic. I started working and I started seeing these uh, issues. Some of them were major bureaucratic bunglings and competence related. Others were pure criminal espionage related. And of course, the most important ones dealt with these operations that were being shut down. And this is FBI's investigation of it by the State Department and the CIA because FBI wanted to pursue these cases, believe me or not. Uh, not guys like Mueller on the top, okay? They are part of the same corrupt, rotten system. When you're looking at agents level, you know, these guys, they felt patriotic. They were outraged, they were, excuse my language, they were pissed that the CIA and the State Department was was ruling the FBI saying well that's what oh, I found that. that's what I found in 17 years of investigating government and corporate crime at every level generally the men and women at the grassroots are really good dedicated people and they're either really naive and buy into the false narrative they're given to carry out tyranny or it's their job and their career and they got kids so they just kind of keep quiet but never go up the chain because they won't do bad stuff I know some Austin police who are really good guys and they wouldn't do things that they see are, you know, is illegal. And so they got busted down from okay, like we're, detectives we're down, back down to beat cops. I mean, here. This uh, is a full hour interview. So there's a, over a, another half hour left to go. And I, it, it's just as good. I, you know, trying to find a spot to break this interview is hard because everything just, you, oh, man, it's amazing. The story is fascinating and it needs to be told and retold. Now my little 9-11 job sticker in the corner covered up her website thing. It was Boiling Frogs. Go check out the Boiling Frogs blog <laughs> or look up the Classified Woman or just Sabelle Edmonds and you'll, you'll find it. Now, um, early, I, we'll just move on. We don't have a lot of time. And one of the things she was talking about, you know, the so-called alternative media doesn't tell you anything. I mean... She didn't say democracy now, but that's one of them. You know, they, they're controlled by the same right or the same multinational money sources. Uh, well, we talked about that on the last show. But uh, I have here a, a, a clip from a source that a lot of people have never, ever even seen or even know about. Um, do you know about Mumia Abu-Jamal? A lot of you probably do. But... Uh, Almost, you know, most of the public doesn't have a clue. He, he was on death row, I think, on a trumped-up charge for killing a policeman. You know, we'll never know. But they found new evidence that 
you know, it, it should have been exculpatory, but instead uh, they just let him out of death row. He was there for over 30 years, and now he's in the general population with no chance of parole. I think that's not fair. But listen to... Uh, the, the reason I included this is, remember when Sibel Edmonds was talking about the tremendous amount of waste in this program, billions and billions of dollars, and then she said, think about, we have people in this country that can't even buy health care. So here's Mumia Abu-Jamal, a little section about three minutes long, called Wealth Care, not health care, Wealth Care. Grounding HIV testing, which is still plaguing so many of our communities, uh, which you all know a lot of that is due to homophobia. Uh, Barack has led by example. Uh, when we took our trip to Africa and visited his home country in Kenya, Yeah, I don't know what happened. I just erased it or something. But let me, I'll get it here real quick. There it is. It, it did it again. Oh, there. Okay. Now we got it. As Congress wrestles over the parameters of a health care bill, amidst maddened catcalls of death panels and socialism, I'm reminded of the experience of John Black, an old trade unionist, revolutionary activist, and journalist. Black, a supporter of the Cuban Revolution, joined the Vincent Ames Brigade, an annual trek of foreigners to the island who assisted in harvesting the sugar crop and other mostly agricultural work. Although he was in his mid to high 70s at the time, Black did his part until the searing tropical heat, or perhaps the work, or both, took its toll. Black was taken to a nearby hospital and received what he called excellent treatment. As he was leaving, he reached for his wallet and began pulling out some dollars. The doctor looked at him quizzically and then told him to put his money away. We treated you because you were sick, senor, the doctor explained, not for any money. Black was surprised and shocked by his first experience with socialist medicine. It moved him deeply. What is even more remarkable is that Cuba was doing this during its so-called special period, a time of economic chaos when Cuba's biggest trading partner, the Soviet Union, stopped bartering with the island and began demanding cold cash for trade. As of 2006, Cuba had a gross domestic product, or GDP, of $45 billion, about the same as the Congo or the Sultanate of Oman. The GDP measures the market value of goods and services purchased within a nation over a given time period, usually a year. Do you want to know what the U.S. GDP was for 2007? Over $13 trillion. $13 trillion. Guess which country provides free medical care? The richest nation in Earth's history can't agree on how to ensure its citizens get good health care balking over the interests of insurance and pharmaceutical companies. One of the poorest nations on Earth, Cuba, not only provides free universal health care, but it provides well-trained humanistic doctors to developing and poor countries all over the world. In fact, there are more Cuban doctors helping people overseas today than there are from the United Nations World Health Organization. We need to stop rapping about so-called health care and call it what it is, wealth care. From death row, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio. Yeah, now, that's a, a, a perfect example of how the moneyed interests have taken over every part of our society, not in any way for our own good. They don't care about what is good for the people. They only care about what enriches them. And they'll do anything to enrich in themselves. Anything. The richest country in the world. And they got it all tied up so that we don't spend anything for the people. Well, we're not really going to have time. We only got about three minutes left. I can't open up the phone line. So the next show will be June 9th, and uh, 
when when I just when I played this last clip of Mumia Abu Jamal, my computer messed up and I played a, a little clip. I'm not a birther. In other words, I'm not one of those people that goes around insisting that President Obama is from Kenya. But there's a substantial group of people doing it now. There, there's a, uh, a major controversy. But this clip that I, I'm going to go ahead and play it right now again. This is uh, Michelle Obama a few years back before uh, Barack became president. And she was talking to a crowd and she, she mentioned something. I, I mean, you can see how this all adds up. But she talks about his home country of Kenya. So we'll go ahead and play that. It, this is just an aside. I don't care about this, but it might. I mean, this is just an example of how they got us fighting over every little thing. In, we should be arguing about bringing the troops home and ending, you know, savage attacks on countries all over the world. We've got to start talking about paying the world reparations. We've got to start talking, you know, about so many important things. But anyway, listen to this little clip and I'll see you on June 9th. Founding HIV testing, which is still plaguing so many of our communities, uh, which you all know a lot of that is due to homophobia. Uh, Barack has led by example. Uh, when we took our trip to Africa and visited his home country in Kenya, uh, we took a public HIV test uh, for the very point of showing uh, folks in Kenya that there is nothing to be embarrassed about in getting tested. Uh, and we did it as a couple. Well, a victory for opponents of the NDAA. Okay, well, yeah. Basically, uh, I've got one more live show coming up in June on June 9th. And the uh, June 23rd show will be a canned show that we'll make a week beforehand. But... Uh, You'll, you'll have uninterrupted coverage, basically. <laughs> Be sure to go to the Omega channel on the 251 Omega on YouTube. And I recommend, for those of you who want to really have a good video to see, go to the Ace Hayes channel, Ace Hayes SGS, on YouTube and watch episode 9. It's showing currently on our cable access channels here in Portland, but... Uh, Go check out Ace Hayes. Google Ace Hayes, and when you get there, look at episode number nine. It's called Cats and Mice. And uh, it was 20 years ago that he made that, and it sounds like they're talking about today. So anyway, another show in the can. Talk to you later.